I'm, we're going to start with a little video here just to sort of help people go back in time to sort of feel the sense of what it was like during the financial crisis so that when we uh, talk about these things, there'll be more of a sense of reality than it is when you're a couple of years later. Um, so why don't we get started with that? <coughs> Given that there's a big crowd here, it must be that everybody's trying to find out from us whether their bank will be bailed out in the future. So they know where the money, whether it should go into mattress or banking system. It's, it's actually food. Good. <laughs> 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 Thanks. 
they decide that these banks were too big or too interconnected to fail under the normal way, way in which you reorganize or liquidate an institution. Instead, they nationalized the banks, they bailed them out with government injections of capital, or they wound them down in an ad hoc way outside the ordinary bankruptcy proceedings in a way that they thought was more orderly, take AIG as an example. Um, Lehman Brothers is probably the notable exception to this pattern, and at least in Europe is blamed for triggering the financial crisis, even though that's not really credible. According to the chairman of the FDIC, Sheila Baer, the governments did not choose bailout because they wanted to. They faced a genuine Hobson's choice between allowing what might be called systemically important banks or other financial companies uh, to fail. That's what we mean by a SIFI, a systemically important financial institution, uh, or risk a total collapse of the US or global financial system. In other words, government officials chose the lesser of what they thought were two evils. In some countries, this pattern of bailouts caused public outrage because of the enormous uh, costs or risks to taxpayers. The, un the unfairness of, fail of bailing out large institutions, but not small institutions, and the moral hazard created by protecting depositors and other creditors of large institutions for bearing the consequences of their bad choices. Taxpayer-funded bailouts have led to battle cries of never again. Politicians and regulators all over the world have promised an outraged public that they will never again permit taxpayer-funded bailouts. And I might add that these same politicians were supportive of taxpayer-funded bailouts during the financial crisis. In the US, we have responded to this outcry with something called the Dodd-Frank Act. This act does not make crises less likely. It doesn't address bubbles and popping of bubbles, asset price bubbles. Uh, but it does try to make the systemically important institutions, or SIFIs, more resilient to economic shocks by imposing higher capital, higher liquidity, and other prudential requirements and limitations on their activities. Dodd-Frank also creates a new orderly liquidation authority uh, for non-bank SIFIs. There's already a special provision for banks that applies to big and small banks. And they've used that model to create what they call an orderly liquidation authority for non-banks that are systemically important. This new authority permits the FDIC to take control of an insolvent SIFI um, and to transfer all or part of whatever viable part of this business that they think needs to be kept alive. They can transfer it to something called a bridge financial company. And then they can either sell the bridge to a third party, recapitalize it by converting debt to equity, we'll talk a little bit about that later, or liquidating, selling off pieces over time, sort of the way AIG was liquidated. By providing tools to preserve or promote financial stability while ensuring that shareholders and creditors ultimately bear the losses of the institution, this new authority is supposed to provide a credible alternative to the Hobson's choice between bailout or what is referred to as a disorderly liquidation or reorganization of the bankruptcy code. Um, there are alternatives that have been discussed that we may talk about if you want to. There are things called contingent capital, which is basically debt capital that would convert into equity and sort of help recapitalize an institution when certain triggers are occurred, when it gets into trouble. There is something called bail-in, a fancy word, the opposite of bailout. Bail-in, where if you convert uh, potentially the entire liability side of a financial institution's balance sheet into equity to recapitalize it. There are also proposals to modify the bankruptcy code to make it a better uh, way to work for a financial institution during a crisis like occurred in the fall of 2008. But will any of these measures really solve the too big or interconnected to fail problem making bailouts unnecessary? It's not a question of whether we should have bailouts. I don't think anybody thinks we should. The question is whether we will, because uh, authorities will feel compelled to choose bailout over uh, a complete collapse of the financial system. Would a renewed commitment to the bankruptcy code or one of these alternatives, if we just had more backbone, will that solve the problem? Um, what are the conditions that led most of the politicians and regulators who enacted Dodd-Frank to actually support bailouts? When, it was, when they were there. Are they making, are politicians making po promises that they can't keep? 
is the answer really just a matter of electing politicians and appointing regulators who have more backbone? Have we done anything to change the conditions that made the siren calls of bailout so compelling during the most recent crisis? These are some of the questions that Dean Mahoney and I will hope to address, either directly or indirectly, in our discussion. Now, the public debate of these fundamental issues has been, in my view, extremely disappointing to date. It has sounded more like a close-minded uh, argumentation than an open-minded truth-seeking. There's been a tendency on all sides of the debate to simplify the problem and simplify the solutions. The increasingly cross-border nature of the problem, fueled by globalization, makes it more and more intractable. But increased globalization is inevitable and irreversible, so the complications it creates have to be addressed. One of the reasons the debate has been so superficial um, is that we don't even have a common lexicon of the key concepts that we seem to be arguing about. For example, just what is a bailout? Um, if the solution to the Hobson's choice between bailout and a disorderly liquidation is an orderly liquidation, what in the world is an orderly liquidation? What makes a liquidation or reorganization of the bankruptcy code so disorderly? Without agreed upon definitions of the terms bailout and orderly liquidation, we have a tendency to sort of talk past each other. There are many other terms that one could, what is, what is a total collapse of the financial system? What is financial stability or instability? When do we draw the line? What is moral hazard? Uh, what are deposits? What's there to deposit and other types of credit? What makes banks special? Uh, let me suggest at least a workable definition of the term bailout, since this is one of the things we're debating here. And I think this is, uh, you won't find this in a dictionary, but it's my sort of created, I've sort of created a definition, I guess. And I think that, um, I'll just say that I'll just define in a way that I think everybody can agree that a bailout is any program in which taxpayers ultimately, and I stress ultimately, bear the risk, bear the losses of a failed firm. Uh, for example, the financial assistance is provided to Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae as a bailout. That money is never going to be repaid. But what about temporary emergency liquidity facilities, credit support or insurance programs that do not result in taxpayers ultimately bearing the losses, but do expose government agencies and taxpayers to some risk of loss? Are those bailouts? I don't think there are certain things. Do you think that the answer is no, at least some of the time? For instance, one of the central functions of a central bank is to provide liquidity during a financial crisis, usually on a secure basis, usually on a, um, at a penalty rate of interest. But this is because banks can, you, when you get in a financial crisis, a, a bank, because it has short-term liabilities and long-term assets, oops, sorry, I'm calling out a professor. Um, <laughs> Uh, tends to the liquidity squeeze. If you can just be given a little bit of liquidity on an emergency basis, things calm down, it can usually get through that, and it's not actually insolvent. And so central banks for centuries have provided what's called the lender of last resort function. And nobody, at least gen generally, has said that's a bailout that should be eliminated. Uh, another thing is deposit insurance. Deposit insurance clearly creates a moral hazard. Depositors are less careful monitoring their banks because their de retail deposits are insured. Um, in fact, that was one of the arguments against deposit insurance in the 1930s. But it has clearly solved the problem it was designed to solve, which is runs on banks. But most people would not say that's a bailout. But it becomes a little tricky when you move over to other powers that are very similar. For instance, the Federal Reserve used a power called, well, a power that comes under Section 13.3 of the Federal Reserve Act which allows it to be basically be a lender of last resort for non-bank institutions. And that's actually the power that the Federal uses for, for virtually all of its programs during the, all of the stabilization programs that sort of pulled out that little 13-3 and, and created a program. Um, some people have suggested that that sort of bailout, for instance, 13-3 was used to provide liquidity to AIG to allow it to be sort of broken up over time, and yet you know, AIG is referred to a bail, as, as a bailout. Uh, but why is it that the, that's distinguished from the normal, what are called, what's called discount window authority, which is available to banks? The FDIC also has something called a temporary liquidity guarantee program, where they guarantee the debt of newly issued debt that met certain qualifications of financial institutions throughout the um, economy. That 
has sometimes been referred to as a bailout, but again, what's the difference between that and deposit insurance or the traditional central bank lender of last resort authority? Um, I guess I think the uh, I think the debate over bailouts would be more fruitful if we could agree on the definition. And the definition I propose is one where the taxpayers actually have um, out-of-pocket losses. Let me also offer a working definition of the term orderly liquidation. That gets used a lot by the FDIC and others. In fact, there was just a speech I was reading this morning in which the FDIC chairman explained that the problem with Lehman Brothers is it was a disorderly liquidation. And if the FDIC had only had the power it has, you know, that liquidation would have been orderly. Of course, no one ever defines what in the world is the difference between orderly and disorderly liquidation. I think that orderly liquidation is one Forget about the word liquidation. It's a liquidation, reorganization, or recapitalization of a failed firm in which the value of the firm is maximized for the benefit of creditors and other shareholders. Any going concern value is preserved. The losses imposed on creditors and other stakeholders are minimized. And the liquidation, reorganization, or recapitalization is carried out in a way that mitigates or avoids severe financial instability including that it, that it stems runs throughout the financial system and preserves the critical, fun, critical functions such as payment systems and security settlement systems. And I assume everybody knows what a run on bank is. Think of it's a wonderful life. Everybody lines up for their money at one point. If they all want their money now, the bank fails because it can't liquidate its loans and other assets quickly enough. Um, so that's an order of liquidation. And, I actually think that um, on, there's a lot of area of, uh, of agreement um, between uh, Randy and me. Uh, it, it seems clear to me that, in theory, um, there can be situations in which a temporary infusion of cash uh, from, the, uh, from the government, uh, coupled with the regulatory expertise that the government can bring to bear, can restructure or sell off a distressed financial entity at basically a very low, at no cost and low risk to taxpayers and, and with less disruption to the financial system. So the question is whether this actually happens in practice and whether we know enough about when these special situations are occurring and can limit the government's intervention to just those situations. And that's the point on which I'm, I'm going to uh, express the skeptical view. Um, my own view is that uh, some of the concepts that are discussed uh, in, in this context, too big to fail, too interconnected to fail, systemic risk, are really statements more about the behavior of politicians and regulators than about the behavior of markets. And, and what I mean by that is, is this. I, I think it ought to be fairly uncontroversial that elected officials and regulators uh, really dislike um, and, and will take uh, 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 and, and have very strong incentives to uh, avoid imposing pain today or allowing pain to occur, if at all possible, even at the cost of imposing more pain at some point in the distant future. If that distant future is distant enough, current officials won't be around uh, to get blamed for whatever pain uh, is experienced then. But they can and will be blamed for any pain that is experienced today. Um, that's, of course, why we all know that Social Security is the so-called third rail of American politics, because any fix to, the, to its long-term uh, problems will involve uh, uh, making someone worse off today. So similarly, when a financial institution is in distress, the pain of a bankruptcy proceeding is very real. Uh, creditors will lose money, uh, probably employees will lose jobs. Regulators will be blamed for not doing something to prevent whatever uh, risky behavior caused the uh, failure in the first place, and, and the regulators don't like being blamed. But there is a real, uh, and I think quite substantial, long-term cost to bailing out a failed financial institution. It creates a strong incentive for other financial institutions 
to take ever larger risks. Because paradoxically, one thing we learned from bailouts is if you lose $100 million, that's just your tough luck. If you lose $100 billion, that's the taxpayer's tough luck. So your objective is to make sure your bets are as big as possible so that if you lose, you can socialize uh, that loss rather than airing it um, yourself. So um, I, I want to just start with a little bit of theory. You know, I'm, uh, unfortunately, as a professor, I like teaching more than I like debating. So, so, so let me talk a little bit about um, what, what we mean uh, by some of these terms, as, as did uh, Randy. So let's start with liquidity, um, because that's a term that just pops up everywhere in, in this debate. Many of these uh, bailouts are said to respond to liquidity uh, crisis. Well, we say that an asset is liquid if it can be converted into cash almost immediately at a price that is not significantly lower than the price at which I could convert it into cash at my leisure. Okay, so let's take an example of an illiquid asset. My house is an illiquid asset. Now there are plenty of buyers and sellers of houses, and it's relatively a, an easy and straightforward thing uh, to sell a house. But because no two houses are exactly the same, the process uh, of, of selling a, a house, the process by which buyers and sellers find one another, is pretty time consuming and laborious. Well, but let's imagine that for some reason, I needed cash right away, say by the end of the day tomorrow, and my house uh, happened to be the only asset that, that, that I could sell to get that cash. Could I convert my house into cash by the end of the day tomorrow? Well, yes, I mean, I could, but I would suffer a huge discount to what I think of as its market price in doing that. I don't know, I've never tried to do it, but I would assume that I'd lose 50% or more of the value of the house if I needed to convert it into cash uh, by the end of the day tomorrow. And that is how a finance economist measures liquidity. It's the amount of the discount that you suffer if you need to convert to cash immediately rather than letting things run uh, their ordinary course. Now, an asset can be highly liquid, that is to say, have a very low discount or no discount, uh, for one of two reasons. It might be that by contract, you have the right to cash in that asset at any time at some uh, a price determined by some uh, formula or contractual provision. Or second, you may, the, the asset may be highly liquid because it's fungible with a lot of other very similar assets. There's a large trading market that operates more or less continuously for that sort of asset. And so it's very easy to find a buyer very quickly who will be willing to pay uh, essentially the, the, the market price. So an example of the first kind of liquidity is my checking account by contract. The bank agrees to give you 100 cents on the dollar uh, any time uh, that I want access to that cash. Another example is an open-end mutual fund. The fund, by contract, agrees to redeem shares in the fund at the end of any business day at a price equal to the market value of the underlying assets. So in both cases, I have liquidity as a matter of contract. An example of the second, uh, would be 100 shares of a company traded on the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ. There is an extremely active market in those shares, and I can sell them at any time the market is open for a price that reflects the current value that traders assign to those shares. But let's imagine that instead of selling 100 shares of Microsoft, um, I'm Bill Gates and I want to sell 84 million shares, which is about 10% of the entire company. I would have to either be patient and let things take their course, probably do a kind of road show and get an investment bank to help me and so forth to get the full market value of their, those shares, or if I needed to sell them immediately, I'd have to take a substantial discount. So 100 shares of Microsoft are extremely liquid, 84 million shares of Microsoft are not so liquid. Now why does that matter? Why am I talking about liquidity? Well, 
central to the way banks operate, indeed central to their creation of value for society, is that their liabilities uh, are more liquid than their assets. And I'm just going to put up a very quick diagram uh, here to show that. Um, so this is a bank. Uh, so you can see that uh, it takes cash from its uh, depositors and other uh, short-term creditors. And in return, it promises them liquidity. So again, my checking account, I'm promised access to that cash anytime I want it. Um, but on the asset side, uh, over here, it is lending money to borrowers who give back illiquid assets. That is to say, they do not promise to pay back uh, the bank in most cases anytime the bank wants the money, but at some uh, distant future date. The bank can, in principle, sell those loans, but uh, if it needs to do it quickly, it might not be able to get uh, uh, as much money for it as if it just waited uh, until the borrower uh, paid the money back. And, and why does this model work? Why aren't banks constantly running into problems? Well, it's essentially just the, 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 the same analytically as insurance. That is to say, with, with insurance, we don't know whether any given person is going to uh, die or have an auto accident or have their house burned down uh, in any given year. But over a very large number of people, we can predict the frequency of those events and spread that risk. Well, similarly, I don't know on any given day which of the many depositors of a bank will happen to need um, their money, but I can predict over a large number of depositors uh, the percentage who will need their money on any given day. And so I can be relatively confident that uh, I don't have to sell off those illiquid assets to meet my um, uh, depositors and other short-term creditors' needs uh, for money. Well, but of course, uh, what if some external event occurs that makes a large number of people want to have access to their money immediately? In order to satisfy them all, the bank may have to convert some of these illiquid assets into cash. Uh, by definition, by the definition I've just given you, the fact that they're illiquid means I can't do that quickly at a good price. I'm going to get a bad price uh, for those assets. Now, in principle, that means the government could provide temporary financing to this bank so that the bank doesn't have to sell the assets, but instead can just uh, provide the cash that its uh, depositors happen to want. Well, if that happened to a single bank, we might well say, tough luck. Uh, the, sure, the government could solve this problem, but why should it? And the traditional uh, answer that uh, people give is something called systemic risk or contagion, which are just fancy names for third party effects, the uh, 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 sort we talk about in the classroom all the time. Well, what third party effects are going on here? There are basically two. One is, if so if our bank up here is selling off these illiquid assets at terrible prices, well, other banks hold similar assets. And when those, when the short-term creditors of those other banks see that my bank here is getting terrible prices for these assets, they might be worried that their bank's assets are not worth very much, and they may want to uh, get their cash out of the bank quickly uh, as well. Second, over here, some of these other short-term creditors are themselves banks. And if my bank up here can't sell its assets for a good price, it may not be able to pay off those short-term creditors in full. And again, the depositors and short-term creditors of those banks may get nervous and want to run for the exits uh, as well. So that's the, the worry about uh, liquidity problems at one bank spreading to uh, uh, other banks. And um, so that's the theory, and, and it's a theory about which I'm going to be a little bit skeptical. And I'm going to start off with one um, uh, example of what I think are the, 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 the underlying problems with the theory. And so we were supposed to segue and then sort of asking one another questions. So I'm going to start with this question, and that is, 
whether in fact we think that there's any such thing as a pure liquidity crisis as opposed to just making a really dumb investment decision. Uh, and, and I'm going to give uh, a really simple example because, of course, a lot of the entities that got bailed out in 2008 were not commercial banks. They were investment banks or other financial institutions. One of the uh, sort of financial institution bailouts that really set, uh, I think, part of the expectations about the government's uh, reaction to a, a crisis at a large and interconnected financial institution. It was back in the late 1990s, uh, a, a hedge fund called Long-Term Capital Management. So those entities, by and large, got in trouble through derivatives trades of one sort or another. And because it, they can be complicated, I kind of scratch my head and say, what's the simplest one I can come up with that will illustrate the problem? And let me, so let me try to illustrate the problem. The really simple, this is an old uh, arbitrage trade that's been around for a long, long time, uh, very well understood in markets, and lots of people do it. Uh, so here's the setup. This trade involves two bonds. Uh, bond A, which is a 30-year Treasury bond issued about seven months ago. Bond B, uh, a 30-year Treasury uh, issued one month ago. Now, here's a bizarre thing, okay? The bizarre thing is that institutional investors, when they trade the 30-year Treasury, tend to like to trade the most recently issued one, the one that is called on the run. Now, why is this? Beats me. I have no idea. But it is one of those things that once everyone expects it to be the case, it becomes self-fulfilling, right? It's just like why um, at any given time there is some nightclub in New York that is the most popular nightclub for celebrities to go to. Once you expect that your fellow celebrities are going there, you want to go there. And if they expect that you're going there, they want to go there. So it doesn't really much matter why this is a popular nightclub. It just is. Well, it doesn't really much matter why people like to trade the online to run a 30-year treasury, but they do. And as a consequence, it is often the case that the non-on-the-run treasury bonds trade at a slight discount because they are less liquid because people aren't trading them as much to the on-the-run treasury bond. So let's just make an assumption. If they open a business today, bond A, which is not on the run, yields 4.6%, and bond B yields 4.5%. Remember, as you always hear on TV when you're watching the ads, if you're paying attention to them, that price goes in the opposite direction of yield. So that means that bond A is a little bit cheaper than, uh, than uh, bond B. Now. Um, when I used to teach my derivatives class, I would set up something like this, and, and then I would say, okay, let's make money. Okay, so let's make money. How do I make money knowing this? I know there is somebody in the, in, in, in the room who can make money for me. Yeah? Sell B, buy A. Okay, so let's buy A and sell B. Exactly. So that's what we're going to do. And by the way, and note the number. So if I do one bond, which is a $1,000 face value, and what happens is I buy, uh, I buy A and I sell B, and in fact, the next time the Treasury issues, uh, a 30-year bond, which will be, uh, by this hypothesis, in about five more months, then there's going to be a new bond that's going to be on the run, and my current uh, bond of B is no longer going to be on the run, and by hypothesis, it's going to be less liquid, its price is going to fall, and that means that the price of A and B should converge in about five months. Now, I don't know where interest rates are going to go in the interim. So they might both shift up in price. They might both shift down in price. But whatever happens, they're going to converge in price. At least that's what I expect to happen. So if that happens, and I guess right, and they converge exactly 
in five months. It, that's just wonderful because I've now bought the cheap one, sold the expensive one. I can buy back the um, the uh, the the, uh, the uh, expensive one at the now cheap price. Unwind the trade, and I've made money. Here's the problem: I paid forty dollars on that on, on that one thousand um, dollar. Now, if I have any JD MBAs in, in the room, did you go to business school to make $40 on, on a trade? No. So how do I make real money? I need to trade in size. So I want to uh, buy $1 billion of Bond A from Bank C, and I want to sell $1 billion of Bond B from Bank D. And that's great, because I mean I could make $40 million on this trade. And I've really got only two problems in executing that. One is I don't have a billion dollars, and two is I don't have Bond B. Other than that, it's the, just the nippiest idea um, I've ever come up with. Um, so, let's solve the first problem. Uh, I borrow bond B. Okay, I borrow it from bank E. Now, you might think, wow, that's pretty nifty. I mean, I can just go to bank E and say, give me a billion dollars worth of this bond. Well, yeah, they'll, they'll do that, but they will require that I post collateral. In fact, collateral in, a, in an amount slightly more than the value of the bond. So I'm assuming they asked for up 1.05 billion in collateral. So I still haven't really solved my other problem about the not having a billion. In fact, if I don't have a billion, I probably don't have 1.05 billion. So I haven't really solved that one. But when I buy bond A, I don't necessarily need to just let it sit in my desk drawer. So why don't I lend bond A to bank F and then it needs to give me collateral in the amount of 1.05 billion. And now I've got my billion dollars to buy bond A in the first place. I got a little tricky little timing issue here, but if I can make this all happen simultaneously, this trade is self-financing. It doesn't require any upfront money. And in five months, I get $40 million. I mean, this is great. Okay, what's not to like? Well, <laughs> The only little teeny problem here is that even if this is guaranteed, and it's not guaranteed, it's just highly likely to work five months from now, I don't know what's going to happen in the interim. And it is possible that that one-tenth of a percent difference in the yield could actually get wider rather than narrower in the interim. I only know that five months from now I think they're going to converge, but I don't really have any theory about what they're going to do in the meantime. That's important for the following reason. This uh, borrowing that I'm doing of this bond, well, the way that borrowing market works is it's overnight. So I've got to roll this over every single day. And guess what? If the price starts moving against me, Bank E is going to want more collateral. So what happens if I've been doing this a month later, bond A yields 4.8%, bond B yields 4.4%. Here's what happens. Bond A is worth less money than it used to be. So the guy who's posting collateral with me is now uh, posting about um, $300 million less, or $1.02. Billion, whereas, uh, excuse me, 30 billion less, uh, whereas bond B has gone up in price, which means that I have to post more collateral than I used to, uh, in this case, also by about uh, $30 billion. What's the net? The net is, right now, I've lost $60 million on this trade, and it was supposed to be free money. Well, if my capital is not, say, much more than $60 million, Bank E might get nervous and say, whoa, forget it. I'm not lending that bond to you anymore. I'm not rolling that, um, uh, that trade over again tonight. So you need to return the bond or return uh, the, the one, uh, one plus billion dollars, um, neither of which uh, I uh, unfortunately have right at this moment. So this can be a big problem. 
and it is going to tempt me to run to the, my local friendly regulator, whether it's the FDIC or the Fed or uh, uh, you name it, and say, I've got a liquidity problem. Um, you, I know that I'm going to make money. I know that in just four short months, I'm home free. I'm back in port with $40 million in my pocket. But you know, right now, I, I got this problem. Uh, and I got this problem because I'm $60 million in the red at the moment. We could say two different things about this. I got a liquidity problem. Two, I'm not a very smart trader because I didn't think about the volatility of these assets and that ended up costing me a lot of money in the short run. Which is it? <laughs> well, I'm not saying that. Okay, well that was not meant to be uh, some uh, supernatural response. Uh, <clears throat> Well, if I were the right, what the regular should and will do in that situation, at least assuming this is an isolated instance, is either put a bullet in your head or allow you to file for bankruptcy. But in any event, uh, you, should, you should suffer the consequences of your bad choices. And if we were to bail you out uh, and you're wrong, it isn't a liquidity and you're actually going to lose money, then next time, knowing that you're going to be bailed out, you will take even bigger risks. It won't be $1 billion, it will be $100 billion, and that's not good public policy. But, so my question to you, though, is, um, and actually, let me try a little Econ 110 myself just to add to the um, add to the sort of framework here, because I think it's useful. In addition to the liquidity issue, another thing that's worth uh, understanding is the nature of the money supply and the availability of credit, and it's and it's and how it's used in our economy. So that's why I pulled out this $1 bill, because we all recognize this says this is legal tender for all debts, public and private, and so this is money. But this isn't the only thing that we treat as money in society. We treat our checking books like money. Some people treat uh, uh, just their deposit accounts as money. Um, you might treat, trust your friend as being completely good for it, and so you know a claim against your friend is good for money. There are a lot of things that people treat as money, and um, and it's usually considered. You know, and the Fed sort of defines the money supply as M1, M2, M3, and M1 is basically this stuff, and I think M1 or M1 and a half or M2 uh, is claims against banks, but why not claims against securities firms or hedge funds or any other financial institution, or why not against a widget company? In any event, anything that people behave as if it is money, that it's riskless sort of way to make payments or as a riskless store of value, people will treat like money. Now, for every dollar that gets put into the banking system, the banks will usually say, let's say, I don't, just, I don't make any money by holding this dollar. I've got to lend it out. Now, we have regulations, and even if we didn't have regulations, banks would do it prudently. They'd say, you know, I've got to make sure I've got a little bit of money here to actually pay out to those guys who I promised I will pay whenever they show up at the window. So I'll keep, say, 10%. I'll keep a dime in my vault, and I'll lend out 90 cents out there in the economy. And that 90 cents, somebody's going to take it. They're going to spend it. People are going to receive it, and they're going to put that 90 cents back in their bank, and their bank's going to say, I'll do the same thing. I'll keep 10%, 9 cents, and I'll lend out another 81 cents. And this process goes until this $1 multiplies into $10 in circulation. <clears throat> and our economy, our modern economy, sort of depends on a flow of money and credit. And every time there's a dollar that's created, uh, and that's sort of the money creation process, not by the Fed, but just by the system, there's also a dollar of credit that's created. Um, and all of that is sort of the grease that allows our system to go. It's what allows us to have buildings like this, to have uh, cars, and to uh, have lots of modern conveniences that we otherwise wouldn't have. Now, if you suddenly said, if everybody suddenly was afraid that any of the sources they treated money are now dangerous, and they withdraw it, this $10 worth of money and credit that's flowing out there in the economy will suddenly shrink to $1 again almost overnight or in a very short period of time. And as everybody knows who has ever studied the Great Depression, the Fed during the 30s was blamed for having, uh, maybe wrongly, but to have contributed anyway to the length and size of the Great Depression by contracting the money supply. 
But you see, there are many ways to contract the money supply, and one way is just for people to be irrationally afraid. If you go back a couple of years ago, remember there was the, the market were irrationally exuberant. Sort of a nice way of saying they're putting too high values on things like, say, real estate. We're creating a bubble. When the bubble pops, instead of sort of being rational and saying, okay, well, now it's worth 20% less, people start panicking and saying it may be worth 80% less. That's the sort of situation we were in in September and October of 2008, which is no one really knew what assets were worth. Were they worth 100? Were they worth 90? Were they worth 2 cents? No one knew. And in that situation, if you're a bank that, is, that has a lot of demands where you have to pay off immediately and a bunch of illiquid assets where you can't demand payment, you are going to circle the wagons. You're going to, sh you're going to start, you're not going to be, you're going to pull in all the credit. The flow of credit that you are making available to the guys in the real economy is going to stop. And you can find a situation where all of a sudden, if the banking system is all illiquid at the same time and is allowed to fail, so to speak, um, we could all go back to having just these as opposed to checkbooks or credit or anything else, and our economy would grind to a halt. An analogy would be, imagine if you had all the cars in America and suddenly you had a, sorry for this, a ray gun that somehow you know, shot over, you know, think of Batman or something, a ray gun all over America, and all of the oil and gas, 90% of the cars and oil were suddenly, their oil and gas evaporated immediately they would very quickly grind to a halt. And even if you injected new oil and gas into them, many of them would never be able to start again. And it's the, it's the fear, what, what, what tempts, uh, what tempts, I'll use the word tempt, because that's, I think that's a good word, what tempts regulars and policymakers, or maybe it's rational, to bail out institutions in rare circumstances is the concern that the whole system will collapse and will be back to just having dollar bills as opposed to the 10 times or 20 times the amount of money and credit that we've gotten used to that makes, um, that greases the system. And so I guess my question to you, Dean Mahoney, is in a situation like that in September, October 2008, do you still say, I have absolute faith in letting things work out themselves, we should not bail out, we should never take any extraordinary means, we should just let people suffer the consequences of their choices? I'm, I'm going to see if, uh, if, if I get, have better luck with the mic. Um, so it's a, it's a tough question and made tougher by the fact that, like all arguments about history, we can't rewind the tape and try something differently and see what, what would have happened. So all we can do is make inferences from other things we've observed and try to make the best argument we can about what, what we think might have happened. So did we have a big liquidity crisis in fall 2008? That is to say, were people um, irrationally running for the exits because they were afraid that if they didn't, somebody else would. That would then let, uh, lead to fire sales of assets, which would mean that uh, they would be the one who would uh, be left uh, with, with, without being able to uh, get their money back. We can certainly tell that, that story um, and, and claim that what really happened, as the banks claimed at the time, was, look, our assets have, have fallen some in value, but, but not enough to actually be a matter of serious concern for our depositors. They're behaving irrationally. Uh, and, of, and of course, we really don't mean depositors so much as their derivatives counterparties, who are the people who are really trying to run uh, uh, run for the exits. But but uh, it doesn't really matter which group it is. It's all people who have a contractual right to get some money. Uh, they all wanted to get it. Uh, it seems to me uh, a, a very different story we can tell, and the one that I would find more plausible uh, is that there was not a common decline in value because of any contagion uh, related to liquidity. There was a common fall in value because all of the banks were overexposed to real estate. And as real estate began to fall in value, uh, the creditors uh, of these banks quite rationally concluded that these banks were in deep trouble, 
Uh, I'm not going to name any individual financial institutions because Randy probably represented every one of them. Uh, but uh, many household names uh, in the banking and investment banking sector, it seems to me, were insolvent. They didn't have a liquidity crisis. Their assets were worth less than the claims that their creditors had on them. That is not a situation that we can solve through some temporary uh, restoration of, uh, uh, of, of uh, confidence by some sort of temporary uh, credit facility. Uh, it's a problem that has to work itself out in the traditional way through the assets being uh, 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 being uh, sold to uh, whoever will pay the highest price for them and the claims on the uh, insolvent institutions uh, being reorganized in, in, in one way or another. Okay, let, let me up the ante here just a little bit. That wasn't enough. So now it turns out it's not just a domestic problem. We don't just have to worry about the domestic businesses and individuals being upset that they're now eating out of cans and uh, having uh, dollars under the mattresses, no access to the banking system. Now it's globalized and it results in wars um, or, the, or the risk of wars. Um, the Europeans, for instance, are absolutely adamant that are allowing... Lehman to fail triggered the financial crisis that <clears throat> caused them to have to bail out several of their banks. I do not believe that thesis. Um, in fact, I think, I, I actually agree with Dean Mahoney, there is a natural bias of regulators and policymakers to bail out for exactly the reasons he said. And, and there's also a bias towards saying, oh no, there's these systemic risks, this contagion, who knows, it's unknown. And therefore, you can't let any of these institutions fail lest they be systemic, uh, lest we have a systemic crisis or we melt down. The only way you ever know whether that's true or not is to test it. And Lehman was actually probably a pretty good test, although it's never described that way, at least by the people who were involved in the choices. Um, but I think it was a pretty good test. Now, if you ask the Europeans, they would say, and that proves that we need something other than the bankruptcy code. I don't think it proves any such thing. I actually don't think it was all that disruptive. Um, you will hear people say Lehman was what caused AIG to then have to be rescued. That's nonsense. AIG was in trouble the same weekend Le Lehman was. It just took a couple more days for the Fed to announce its program. Uh, so a lot of these things are serious problems. They're not discussed very seriously. I do. Th it's interesting. One of the hardest questions I think I've had during my career is, when is something insolvent or illiquid? I mean, one of the principles of central banking is you should never make this lender of last result facility available to an insolvent bank, only to solvent banks when they're illiquid. But who in the world can tell the difference? Um, because it depends on what time horizon you give. If, you, if your time horizon is two minutes, then they're insolvent. If the time horizon is three months, you think the price is going to come back. Well, maybe they're just illiquid. For instance, one can debate very seriously, was TARP a bailout of the nine largest banks? Or did it, was it just temporary liquidity? It was actually in the form of what looks like a bailout. It was injections of capital. And yet, all that money was paid back with profit to the government within you know, a year or less. So it appears that it was a liquidity crisis in retrospect. And yet, as Dean Mahoney said, the, the problem is now having been conditioned that that money might be available, there is a, a risk that they might take bigger risks. And so how does the government respond? By regulations, by saying, okay, just to make sure, we're going to now impose higher capital requirements on liquidity to make sure you don't take those bigger risks because we know we've sort of created this moral hazard. Now, one last solution that people often propose, which um, I think it simply shows an ignorance of history, um, is... You know, the solution here is we find ourselves with, it turns out, seven banks that account for 70% of the assets in the banking system. Never mind the fact that we have a shadow banking system with a whole bunch more, okay? And so, you know, what we need is just break these guys up. If we just had a bunch of small banks, then we wouldn't have this problem because they would sort of, you know, randomly sort of fail. The problem is banks don't f fail terribly randomly. If you look at it, it tends to be a bunch in the 1930s, and then almost no one, and then a bunch in the SNL crisis, and then no one, and then a bunch right now. 
And so there's no reason to think that if you took the, let's say you had a bank with $2 trillion of assets and say, you know, what we need to do is we just need to say no bank can have more than 50 billion assets, so we'll split them up into 40 banks. The fact is, is that those 40 banks might be actually more susceptible to failure and, uh, and therefore and have the same $2 trillion uh, involved that might fail. Now, the reason I mention history is if you actually go back and look at the debates about the Great Depression, the diagnosis of the Great Depression was our banking system in the United States, the banks are too small. We need to solve this by consolidating, making them bigger. Now, having done that for during the quiet period for the last nine, you know, 90 years or so, we now say they're too big. We need to break them up. So we've sort of forgotten the lessons. The, the lesson is not too big or too small. It's actually making sure that we have a system that makes bailouts uh, you know, not needed. Now, let's get to the, I guess let's get to the final, you know, as I see people leaving, so we've got to get right to the punchline. Are bailouts inevitable? I think so long as we don't have a credible alternative to at least the bankruptcy code for non-bank financial companies or the current version of the bankruptcy code, let's put it this way, or the current version even of the Federal Deposit Insurance Act, which is a specialized insolvency code for banks. The way it works now, the way the FDIC administers it, would not work for the big systemically important banks. And unless we come up with something that's different, a third way, the government will always face this Hobson's choice between bailout and what, what's called a disorderly liquidation, i.e. one that results in sort of one dollar being left in the uh, credit and money system. And they will blink. So whether they should or not, they will blink. And I think the only way to make sure that bailouts are not inevitable in the future is to create a third way that's credible. Now, Dodd-Frank has, has supposedly added a credible third way for, not, for hedge funds, securities firms, insurance companies, and so forth, anything other than a, a depository institution. So far, the way the FDIC has said that the way it's supposed to work is if a non-bank company failed, and its failure and its liquidation or reorganization under the bankruptcy code would result in severe economic, severe instability to the U.S. financial system, and using this other new authority would avoid or mitigate those risks, then it can be invoked and use it. The problem is the FDI said, well, we'll tell you how we're going to use this authority. We're going to make sure that we crush shareholders and creditors just like the bankruptcy code. Okay, so what's going to be different? And we don't know what's going to be different. And so these, this new authority gives a tool, but it's not at all clear whether the tool will actually be a credible third way or not. And so right now, unless a lot more work is done, my thesis is that bailouts are inevitable. Okay. I, I want to make two very uh, quick observations about um, the, the 2008 um, problems. Uh, one, one is this. Um, one of the reasons that we worry about value destruction in the bankruptcy of an ordinary industrial firm uh, is the existence of specialized assets where you've, you've invested a lot in making uh, a Ford Taurus, and if that company, if Ford is uh, sold off piecemeal, uh, it's going to be hard to redeploy that asset to make some other kind of car, etc. One nice thing about the financial industry is, by and large, the specialized assets are people. People are not going to be destroyed. They're not going to be sold. Um, they can simply move from an old employer to a new employer. I would have thought that a more sensible use of government money, if we're worried about going back to the uh, point, I don't, I don't have my wallet with me, but if we're worried about going back to a barter economy, um, it seems to me that a more sensible way to, to solve that problem and keep credit flowing would have been for the government to take the same amount of money uh, in TARP and say, uh, instead of giving it to banks that uh, were failing, let's give it to entrepreneurs who want to start new banks who can then hire all of these uh, folks who work at the failed banks and can then decide which assets they think are worth it uh, in those banks and buy them at prices that they think uh, are attractive and then they get credit uh, flowing. So that would have been, I think, an, an, an alternative, but one that again uh, I think would have been politically very difficult. The second thing I want to uh, observe 
serve uh, is, and I'm going to do this, I'm going to be deliberately provocative here, and, and I should say that uh, history being history, we're not going to know all, we're not going to be able to connect all the dots about 2008 for a while. Okay, and I should also point out that Ben Bernanke has explicitly said the, the analysis I'm about to give, uh, which other people have, have suggested pieces of, is just flat out wrong. So take that for, for what it's worth. But TARP got paid back in full with profit. Why? Because the banks quickly returned to profitability. Why did they quickly return to profitability? Well, the 800 uh, or whatever billion of TARP was actually a drop in the bucket compared to the amount of liquidity the Fed has been injecting into the financial system. And one way of looking at why banks became profitable very quickly is that for effectively a two-year period, they could borrow from the Fed at effectively zero and then lend to the Treasury at effectively 2%. I can make money doing it. You know, I am smart enough to make money doing that. Um, and the banks, it turned out, were smart enough to make money doing that. But as, as always, there were some unintended consequences, uh, or at least unintended associations. I don't want to say consequences because that is a claim about causation, and we don't know enough yet to say causation. But I will say it was accompanied by a significant rise in commodity prices, including, of course, food prices. One place where the increase in commodity prices, particularly food prices, has been particularly acute has been in Northern Africa. Want to talk wars? There have been wars in Northern Africa over the last couple of months. Can we say that is a consequence of bailing out uh, a bunch of U.S. financial institutions? No, and we won't be able to say that probably for decades, uh, if, if ever. But are there associations there that are very troubling between bailout, lots of liquidity being injected into the financial system to make banks profitable again, rises in commodity prices, unrest. I don't think we can say, oh, it's, it's silly to think that those things could be connected. Yeah, I, that, that was that was uh, that was actually really really terrific, and I totally agree with that. I, I think that one can't just as one can't say it does. You can't say that it, it didn't either. The Fed has certainly been flooding a lot of liquidity into the financial system. So I, I think, in fact, one one point of that is one of the things that's interesting during this crisis. People say, you know, the reason this crisis happened is because the Fed flooded the market with liquidity after the dot-com crisis in 2002-2003. And those idiots, if they hadn't done that, we wouldn't have had the bubble we had. And so now, of course, we're solving the most recent financial crisis by flooding the market with uh, liquidity, keeping interest rates low. And so the real question is, are we setting ourselves up for an even bigger financial crisis uh, 5, 10, or 20 years from now? Thanks. Buy bottled water. That's my advice. <laughs>